Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the ateliers. Um, nice to see so many ex-participants of the ateliers in the audience. And some of our sponsors are here, and uh, our friends from uh, Grimm Gallery. Uh, welcome to you all, and welcome to you, William. I was speaking today, William Monk, who is now back on the old nest. He's worked at the ateliers from 2004 to 2006, so that's 10 years ago. Um, we're happy to see you back in the school again, William. Um, he will introduce his work in a lecture of about one hour, and afterwards you have a chance to ask questions or give comments. Um, for now, I'll invite you to switch off your cell phone, and then we can start straight away. William, the floor is for you. Okay, so I'm going to start just before I uh, began at Dertilliers. So this is the um, studio I had in Paris. Um, my girlfriend at the time, so now my wife, is French, so we were living in Paris. And uh, I had this uh, uh, studio, a tiny little studio in a place called The Territory, which was kind of like a, uh, it was like a squat, except you had to pay rent. So it was, it, was, uh, it was a very weird thing run by a very strange uh, uh, Russian portrait painter who was a a, le a captain in the French Foreign Legionnaires, and uh, he installed spies in the uh, in the place. It was a really weird experience. But uh, I did. Uh, this was the last uh, two paintings I did just before I uh, applied for the uh, for the uh, for the school. I was thinking if I would actually apply to master degrees in uh, London. That's just where my mind was at, and uh, I didn't really know about Dertilliers, and the, the applications were always at around Christmas time. And this was, I guess, this was around uh, um, May June. 2004, and uh, I was Googling, and I, and I saw that there's this place called Dertilliers and the Reichs Academy, and I decided that I would apply to Dertilliers. It, it sounded better, and uh, it looked better, and I still think it's better. Yeah. Um, and um, so the, the, this was the last, uh, these are the last two paintings I made just before the application. The, the, um, this one here in the middle is, uh, is based on a um, essentially two photographs. There's one photograph of the uh, cockpit of the uh, Enola Gay, the, the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, um, which I think it's got the next one here, which, which I'm sure we all know what that looks like. Although I didn't use that photograph, I actually found three separate photographs of taken from different perspectives, and I collaged them together to give it more of a wraparound uh, view. And then the uh, in the background, I wanted something in the background and. Um, uh, I used the, uh, the stained glass window from the uh, Notre Dame in, uh, in Paris, um, probably because maybe I felt like a, a sort of a continuation of that, uh, uh, um, that pattern in the, uh, in the, um, in the cockpit. Uh, and also I kind of like the sort of slightly sort of a, a apocalyptic ju juxtaposition of those, those two images. Um, and then, um, and then the penultimate, the, the very last painting I made before I, I, I went to the, the reason why I'm going to talk about just about these two paintings is they feature uh, later on in, in, the, uh, in, in, in what I've been doing. Um, this painting was, uh, I had a tiny little mini show in Paris uh, and uh, I had like a week to go and uh, a wall missing uh, uh, of space for another painting and I had these two ideas and I chose the simpler one because I didn't have the time and actually it worked out very well for me because with the simpler image I was able to get lost more into the act of the painting. I mean, here you've just got this sort of very, sort of almost uh, a, a binary register of, you know, land, building, and and, uh, and sky. So it's 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 easily read in, in a figurative way. But uh, uh, I was able to get uh, really involved in the um, in the making of it, um, and uh, and actually it was kind of a bit of a uh, turning point for me that to sort of uh, simplify the, uh, the the image. To um, you know, complicate the uh, um, you know the the how as opposed to the what. Then so I had my so I had my interview at the the, the school and she was uh, in the room opposite and um, like I've been asking some of the students and uh, they seem to be they have their interview and then they find out maybe a week later or something. Uh, I don't know whether it's changed, but for me 
I had to go off into the little interrogation room and wait for 15 minutes while uh, Mar uh, Marin, Robin, uh, Dominic uh, deliberated. And uh, to this day, 10 years later, I cannot tell you whether I, I got in by sheer luck or whether they were just playing mind games on me because it seemed like I, I got just lucky, you know. Uh, but, uh, so then the first painting I, I did when I arrived um, was, uh, was this painting. Uh, orange, probably because I was happy to be in Holland and, uh, and celebrating my new uh, uh, residency card. Uh, this was based, um, sort of again continuing from that idea with the, um, uh, the cockpit painting. This was uh, derived again from two images sort of collaged together. Um, one was uh, the, um, so this is, um, um, I want to get this one right because again this is like 10 years old. It's not Nagasaki. This is uh, another, it's, I should be more sensitive to this, but uh, 10 years has been a long time, but uh, it's, it's not Nagasaki. It's, uh, I think it might be Tokyo actually, but it's a bombing raid in the craters. Um, and I collaged this with um, this image, which was the, uh, it's, the, um, it's the storm on, uh, on Jupiter that's, uh, that's um, been going on for God knows how long. And I put those two together and I had an idea and it didn't really quite, like a lot of the ideas I have, they never quite work out on the canvas. Something else sort of happens along the way. And I kind of made this sort of slightly goofy painting and. Um, and then uh, put these sort of astronauts around it. Um, uh, and uh, so that was the very first painting I made when I was here, which was basically in the first two weeks. And, uh, and I might have thought this was a, a good painting, but at the time, you, you know, the, 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 the school is like a boot camp, you know, they, they want to you know, break you down before they build you up again. So, you know, don't, don't go to Tilia's expecting any positive feedback until, until the last week of, of, two, of, of year two. <laughs> you know? um, and of course, if, you, you know, if you're not the most confident, uh, I didn't do a master's degree, you know, because obviously I didn't, um, the, the timing of this, so I hadn't gone through all that rigorous um, uh, art school process. So arriving at uh, Tilia's and discovering that you're being taught by, you know, famous artists like Marlene Dumas and Steve McQueen, you know, it's, uh, you, and then all the opinions you get every week, you kind of initially want to believe everything they tell you like it's the word of God, um, because why wouldn't you? They're, they're, they're who they are and, uh, and, uh, and that's the way it is. But of course, you, all those conflicting opinions is, is very difficult to navigate through and make work. Um, so this sort of stands out as a sort of a, a I wouldn't have been able to make that painting um, midway through. Uh, it would have been a lot of the work of the Atelier's period was, was not very good work, and I, I'm not going to dwell on that here, so I, I want to editorialize my, my work. But occasionally I did some good work in, in the school. Um, so there's the, uh, there's the sources of, of that. Um, this, was, um, this was done, let's see, almost 10 years ago. So it was done in 2005 when uh, I think this was. This was actually this was done in my first year, so it was in the end of two thousand, end of my first year, so it'd be two thousand and five Eastern time. Uh, this was my attempt through navigating through all the bad work, trying to sort of please everybody and everything. This was this was me making a painting for myself, where I just was like, like okay, let's just make a painting that, that I would like to see. Um, there's no source material for this. Uh, the only the only source of inspiration was. Uh, was, was a photograph uh, a friend took of my hands uh, uh, grasped together. Actually, I'd started making the painting the other way around. The, the, the blackness was going to be the uh, was going to be the sky, and then the, the sky was going to be the land. Did almost, I would say, maybe seventy odd percent of the painting in that way. Um, but then flipped it and decided I would finish it and present it the other way. It worked for me much better, inverted, where the the, the land was the, was the blackness and the sky. Um, and also I kind of liked, because I was finishing it the other way around, so these sort of craters, again, there's this crater thing going on. The, the, the craters are kind of pointing downwards and upwards in different directions, so it, had, so it gave it a kind of a slight Escher kind of quality to it. Um, I was, um, a, a lot of the paintings I make, uh, well, almost all of them, if I'm listening to music, uh, it's the same piece of music throughout the entire painting process. I won't change it, I mean, pretty much almost exclusively like that. 
Um, you know, like in a casino, they don't want to have clocks, they don't want to have windows, they want you just to you, you not be so aware of time. So listening to the same piece of music repetitively. And also if it's a long painting and you need to get back into the process and, and know where your headspace was, just to play that same piece of music helps get your rhythm back in groove. But with this painting, and sometimes you know, the, the, it's difficult for me to separate the music from the painting, uh, and that could be kind of arbitrary, but I think in this case that's not quite so. The, the, what I was listening to when I made this was, it wasn't music in fact, it was the um, radio broadcast of um, War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. The one from, um, I think it was the, the 40s, where he managed to convince the, uh, the population that there was actually an alien invasion going on, because he did it in such a sort of a reportage, uh, documentary, realistic manner. And, um, and also, I had just read this book by uh, uh, P.K. Dick, um, who, who wrote the book that they based on Blade Runner, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? But this book was uh, called Martian Time Slip, and in it there's a character who, who has a sort of a, a futuristic alternative um, uh, autism, and they, they're seeing things happen, build uh, sort of civilization spaces, uh, build up, uh, form, crystallize, and decay all within minutes of a, of a, of a normal person's uh, time. And I thought it would be kind of fun to make a painting that was, in my mind at least, uh, having a sort of a, a start, middle, and end. So I would, I, instead of making a bunch of paintings, I would make a bunch of um, uh, paintings of the same um, location on the same canvas and uh, build it up and then sort of decay it and have it sort of uh, um, uh, break apart. Um, then, um, and then uh, about this time, so 10 years ago, so we, we applied for the, the Queen's Prize. I'm not going to try and pronounce it in, in Dutch, the, the, uh, the Queen's Prize. And, um, and uh, I, I applied with the, the orange painting and that cockpit painting. Uh, it, in actual fact, I think this painting is a much better painting than either of those, but, but I think that that because those two paintings, the copy painting was made before I went to Dertilliers and the orange one was done just in the first two weeks. So they hadn't, the sort of, the, the boot camp spirit of Dertilliers hadn't sort of infected my mind and I still had a degree of confidence about those. Whereas this painting, I had no idea whether, you know, uh, its merits I had no idea about. But, uh, uh, I like it now after, after time. But anyway, so there, I, I won that prize. And um, um, what's the next image? Yes. I won that prize, and um, and there was sort of like, you know, a five-minute period in, in my life where I became kind of uh, popular and interesting to a lot of people in the outside world. Um, I say five minutes because you know the vast majority of, of people are, you know, their their interest can't sustain longer than five minutes. But uh, there are there are enough good people out there who, whose interest sustained. Um, but I found the whole uh, experience very uh, disturbing alongside the program of Dertilliers. They weren't, I mean, I think if I maybe went to the Reichs Academy, I think I could have weathered that whole uh, external experience much, much better. But uh, it's, uh, uh, I, 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 people kind of were responding to the sort of, the, the, the sort of juicy elements of those two paintings in the prize. Uh, and a lot of galleries wanted to visit my studio and I think they were all probably expecting or hoping to see, you know, 10 or 12 prize winning paintings, you know, there's a show, let's do that. But of course that's a very naive assumption if, if, if you don't understand how the Dirty Dears program works. So you could see the look of disappointment on as, as, as um, gallery after gallery would come and visit me and they would walk away kind of disappointed about the amount of unfocused work there was in there. Um, this is where I met uh, uh, Jörg Grimm, my, my, my gallerist now of, of, of 10 years. He didn't have that attitude at all, actually. Um, and, uh, and we sort of did a few things um, together, um, it, but we didn't sort of cement the relationship until a couple of years later, which I'll get to. Um, but he actually, uh, as a year after I graduated, he, um, uh, he put a painting of mine in the uh, in the Van Gogh Museum, there was a uh, exhibition of Van Gogh and Expressionism, and there was a sort of a sponsors room where they were. Uh, York was able to select a bunch of um, artists, um, contemporary artists that would have some sort of relationship with, with that show, and and I was in that, and uh, and that was really great for me. I mean, in terms of the, sort of the contemporary art world, quote unquote, the, the Van Gogh Museum is not like, it, but for me that was 
one of the highlights of my career to show in that museum, you know, and to share that same oxygen space with, with, with that, that's those paintings, you know. Um, I wasn't in the same room, but you could actually kind of peer, tilt your head and see a Van Gogh, you know, <laughs> next to my painting, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so anyway, so the, all that sort of um, uh, positive feedback about, oh, you know, we love the juiciness, we love all that color and stuff. I wanted to make a, I wanted to make a painting that was a, 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 what I thought was against all of that. Uh, I didn't want to sort of appease and appeal to that, 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 that interest. So, um, so I made um, this painting, which is uh, derived from those, those, the source material of, the, um, of that orange painting but uh, treated in a different uh, manner. There's, there's no juice, there's no texture. The, the imagery has been cut back. It's a much more... Um, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, the cross, okay, yes, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm seeing it at a really weird angle. I can't see it. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this was basically my sort of anti-Queen's Prize painting. Um, and um, uh, I, I kept this painting, I, I, I've still got it. And, uh, and I like it that way, it's mine. Um, this was all actually at the same similar time. Um, so this is now getting towards, this is now, um, I guess, November, December of, the, um, uh, of the, my second year. So we're now getting into the territory where people, you know, your students are thinking about your end show. You know, and uh, the teachers are kind of like pressing you, what are you going to do? And, and, I, and I had very few paintings that either were very good or that I was able to distantly judge as being very good. So at this point, I didn't think I had anything for my end show. And, I, and, I, and, I was in, and I'm including this painting and that, um, that other painting um, in, in the mix, even though I think they're pretty cool paintings now. I like them. But, uh, uh, so this painting, actually, I should just point out, I called this painting Superman. Just be, I have sometimes I have really stupid titles for paintings. I thought this one looked like, in my imagination, what would it be like if you took Superman and steamrolled him flat and stretched him on, on a canvas? Um, that's not that wasn't the intention when I started the painting. That's just an afterthought. Like it kind of looks like I squashed Superman into a flat pancake and stretched him on a canvas. So I called it I call that painting Superman. Um, yeah. So. Um, um, this time, um, I'd, I'd never really felt particularly inclined to make um, to uh, repeat an image. I'd always felt a new painting was a new image, and, uh, and could never really get my head space beyond the distinction of those two things. But uh, um, Marin showed me a book on uh, Jasper Johns, and uh, of course I knew who Jasper Johns was, but I hadn't really considered him that much or read much about him. But uh, reading that book was quite uh, um, quite a revelation in in, in, in his way of. Uh, Take, taking a, an image and sort of taking it apart and, uh, and, and looking at it from all angles. And, uh, and that sort of timed out, timed in with um, running out of space with the end show. Uh, it got to the point where there was literally um, very little time left and I thought I had to make a whole new show because there's no way I could show anything that I've made. Um, so I uh, had that original, um, that original painting of the, um, uh, of the one I did in, in Paris, which was called The Institute, um, which uh, was taken from a photograph of the uh, Salk Institute in uh, Southern California, in La Jolla, um, which I didn't actually know at the time, I found out subsequently. Um, I, was just, I just found this image on the internet and I liked it and I was kind of looking for something that had a slight sort of, there's a movie in the 70s called Coma, uh, which is this sort of unusual institute building where there's some weird stuff going on. So I, I had that in my mind. That was all for the first painting. With this painting, I had, a, uh, I had a, an idea, a vision that I could make the sec that I could make this painting again, but much, much better. Um, and so I did. In actual fact, now this painting, I made this in essentially 17 hours. Um, this was basically a, a month before the show the month before the deadline to hang the show, the end show, and, I, and, and again, I had no, no paintings to show, certainly no feeling that I had anything to show. So I made this in 17 hours, finished it the next day, tidied it up, but uh, felt great after a 17 hour painting session. I've never had that again, and as a father of two, I'm probably never likely to, but it was a great, uh, I, I loved making that painting. 
absolutely loved making that painting. And it, and it occurred to me, and this, time, this was happening along with the, that Jasper Johns book, and I thought, well, maybe I'll make the show about uh, all the um, variations on this, um, on this, 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 uh, this building. I could make it like a sort of a, a mantra. And, um, um, you know, like the, um, like that Beatles song uh, um, in the White Album, Number Nine, where it's just repetitively saying number nine, number nine to the point where it's, the, our idea of number nine is stripped of any conventional meaning and we can su supply our own, you know. So the, um, the uh, um, so I, I, I had four weeks left, I had, I had uh, four weeks left and I made, I thought I made four more paintings. I got the original one, that's five paintings, that will do, that will fit the show. So I made one painting a week for the last four weeks of the show. Um, I had to also make the stretches in that time as well. I mean, I didn't make the stretches all in one go first, which perhaps would have been a clever idea. So, I mean, I was three days of making the stretcher, three days of painting it, one day of, of, of sleeping, and then all that all over again for, for the last period of the show. Um, so this is actually me making a couple of them. So this is my studio. So this was this, this is the, the big studio up in the, in the top in the corner. Um, so here's the, the end show. And what, what I wanted to do, well you have Van Gogh's drawings, they have this wonderful uh, invented vocabulary where he'll have these sort of abstract marks with this shape will mean this, that shape will mean that, and he'll just invent this whole voc vocabulary of, of, uh, uh, to annotate what, what, the, what it is he's, he's drawing. And I wanted to try and uh, take a little bit of that on board. And, and each time I made a painting, like I, I didn't make them at the same time, and I think it would have been a massive mistake to have done that, um, because I wanted each painting to have its own unique uh, character and to be completely separate from, from each other. And if I felt that there was something going on, some annotation, some mark making that I had done that, that seemed to uh, be quite particular to that painting, or perhaps even um, gave it um, uh, its identity, I would make sure that I would not do that in the next one. So whatever felt particular or key to that painting, ditch it and see exactly, you know, what, you know, how much of the image is 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 is, um, is holding it all together. Again, that sort of binary, you know, the, the sky, the building, and land. Um, so that was the end show. Um, then after the, uh, so then finishing at Dirt Tilliers, I, I was invited to do a, um, a small solo show at the uh, Frisch Museum. The, they had a space called the Bureau Luwaden. Uh, and I did that, and that was basically a collection of the paint. I didn't make anything uh, specific for it because it happened immediately afterwards. So I, I had a couple of these paintings and the paintings from the Queen's Prize and, uh, and some other things. And then I moved back to, um, to Paris and uh, took a studio in, um, in a place called Ivory, which is just uh, south of uh, Paris. A uh, much smaller studio than the one that I was used to in Amsterdam. Massive climb down, which you guys will all know about next year. Um, but having said that though, this was probably the most productive period uh, um, for me. I think possibly after two years of, of, of having the experience in Dirt Tilliers, you know, you, you've, you're kind of like a sort of a wound up coil. And then when you get, when you're sort of set free, you, 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 it's a, it was a very productive period. So um, on, on, the, um, on the left here, you can see there's actually, this is a, at the beginning of a collage of the, uh, the Institute series. I wanted to make a collage version. So I you know, made the paintings and I wanted to see where else I could take it. So um, my wife and I, we were painting all these sheets of paper down, down here, different colors, kind of, I suppose like, you know, sort of like a Matisse uh, cutout, you know, prepping the, the sheets of paper. And then we would cut them up into various shapes, shapes that I would sort of uh, uh, direct. Um, so I'd be like to my wife, "Can I get more blue ones of that, please?" You know. So she would give me different, all the various different types of shapes and colours, and then I was able to put it all together uh, on the painting. Uh, in the middle, you've got here is a drawing of the um, uh, uh, based on the um, that Superman uh, uh, painting, which I after doing the Institute series. This was my first series. I thought well, maybe there's a, a, maybe there's a room to maneuver in that uh, in that blue painting that I did. 
um, but I'm not really a, a, a drawer, I don't really consider myself a drawer, and uh, so I kind of wanted to kind of trick myself into, into thinking it was a painting, so I, I, I lined the paper over canvas, and what you're seeing there is the beginning of it as um, it's actually graphite wash, so that was all applied with a brush. So it's basically making a painting with drawing materials. Uh, that's, the, that's the collage almost finished. There's obviously, the bottom half was still to go. You can see all the little tubs in the bottom right here with all the different shapes and things. Um, uh, so at this point, actually, yeah, so I had a, um, um, there was a gallery in uh, Germany that came to visit me and, um, and uh, around this time, and, um, and they, they thought that everything was very unfocused. Which, which I thought was remarkable because of by my, my standards of Dertilliers, I thought this was pretty together. But they thought it was unfocused. And then they said, well, we'll come back in six months when you've made basically the show before they would decide if they wanted to give me the show. And I, I, I said to them, probably quite cocky actually uh, in hindsight, but I said, that sounds like you want to bet on a horse that's already finished the race. You know, it's like, if you wait till the paintings are finished, you'll have to see them in someone else's gallery made, you know? <laughs> Uh, luckily, uh, then, then literally, it was almost in, in very short time, actually, uh, um, uh, Grimm Gallery, uh, Jorgen Hanna came to visit me, and they saw almost the same stuff, you know, and they didn't have any, any uh, issue with the, the lack of focus or whatever, you know, they, they were interested in the, in the artist, uh, you know, which is, which is perfect, because I don't want someone to represent my, the painting that I've made, I want them to represent me. You know, so there's, there was an instant uh, uh, sort of a, a bond of trust, you know, and if you can give trust, then you get it back. So it's, it's that they trusted me instantly. I've trusted them ever since, and, and that's been a 10-year relationship so far that uh, I hope continues. Um, so they, so he, when he came to visit me, he offered me a show. Um, so I um, expanded that blue uh, painting into a series. This middle one here is actually, uh, that's Superman, but the series itself is not called that. It actually, so this one here is called blue number three, and there's blue number two over there. And the kind of a little bit like with the Institute, um, um, taking one element and, and denying it to the next one. Um, the same thing was going on in here, although I also expanded it to the way that it was presented. But every painting uh, is, is unique and autonomous and has got uh, uh, a lot going on that the other ones don't. But in the photography, you don't really, you know, you're just confronted with the, sort of the blue. But that's all a unifying thing, you know, the, um, and on the other side. So this was, a, that was the drawing there, finished, and there was another one there. Um, again, I mean, I could talk about the, the one in the middle in some depth, but I think I, I won't, I'll save the time for other things. Um, um, again, looking at, you know, um, I wanted to remake the cockpit painting. I thought I could do that a lot better as well after having regained some confidence uh, in myself. And, uh, and, also, and uh, even though I made this in, um, so this studio in Ivory, I'd actually moved to a, a new studio that we bought in Montreux, Montreux. Montreux. Uh, which is on the east side of Paris. And I had good access, but uh, in the studio in Ivry, the access was very poor, and so I had to do this. The, the multi-paneled work actually started out of necessity because I couldn't get the work in and out of my studio. You know, every, uh, all, all these sort of things you see in painters' work, they have the most sort of prosaic reasoning. You know, in um, uh, um, Surratt's uh, painting that's in Chicago, you know, is it called the, the jet, the, you know, with the, the figures on the side on the riverbank? There's a weird uh, foreshortening on the side, on the left-hand side, but this perspective is odd. It's because he had a staircase that was two feet away from that side of the painting and he couldn't stand back. You know, there's always some reason. Well, in Cezanne's uh, Big Bathers painting in, in, uh, in um, the National Gallery in London, there's this very strange sort of cinemascope thing going on at the top and bottom, and I've never read anything, any reasoning as to why that's there. I'd love to know why, but... Uh, have a look at that painting the next time. It almost looks like it's presented in cinemascope. Um, yeah, but uh, um, but this particular format, I actually lifted straight from a Vuillard, paint, a Vuillard painting, um, uh, the, the Nabi painter, who's I think it was a, a the panel was either a, um, 
the panels were either a paravent or they were, they were designed, I think, to maybe fit between the spaces in those Haussmann buildings in Paris. Um, but I, but I, for me, it was very useful to, to work like this because of I, because of, also something like this had a very quite strong image. I need to break up the image all the time through the act of making it. You, you, you paint, you work towards the image, and then you want to destroy the image and then get back into it and keep and keep that whole process going. Otherwise, it just becomes a, a, a sort of an illustrative exercise. Otherwise, so having these multiple panels, it just it allowed me to sort of move them about in the studio and and uh, and kill the image instantly. Um, same thing with this, a lot of paint being thrown. And again, I mean, that, that's not a stylistic device, although there's always that danger, but it's, it's again, it's just about destroying the image uh, and to allow me to then to re rebuild it up again. Um, this painting, I'd actually done a painting similar to that. So this is actually my second show at Grimm Gallery. Although I'd made a painting similar to this in the first show, but it didn't have. Uh, but I wanted to show this one because the top part um, is something that, that features later on. I wanted the painting that was largely about the sky, and it was hung quite low, and you're pretty much sort of confronted face to face with just just the sky. It's very difficult in the photograph, but there's it's very text, it's very sort of uh, 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 textural, and. Uh, and the, um, this, this shape above, I wanted to sort of do something to, to match the, the, the shape below. So you had this almost this concaved space of sky. So it was almost like a sort of a, uh, uh, an unrealistic or a space that didn't exist in, in the, the, the figurative scale of what's presented. You know, it's almost like a stage of, 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 a, of the sky sort of wrapping around. Um, but this particular shape up here, I, 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 I used, um, developed it later on. And also, the, so the source material for this, you see, is this. Yeah, this is the photograph. So uh, I just basically just cut out the interesting part, the mountain, and concentrated on, on the bottom bit. Because it kind of felt like teeth to me. I thought I'd make a painting that had almost like a character of, 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 of teeth at the bottom. Um, uh, well, OK, so the, um, that was the. Um, that was my intro. Do I not have a show of that? A picture of that show? Maybe. Um, this is a photograph of a, a Google satellite. This is actually in, uh, I think it's Mers, Mississippi. This, this river is not actually the Mississippi. It's, I think it's one of the, the tributary, the part of the Mississippi. The, the main action is actually going on over here. But this section, uh, I, I thought, saw the potential of making a painting. Um, actually, I've made two, paint, made, made two paintings based on this, or I've done more. But uh, if you, this section here, the lighter part, um, where you have this snaking, uh, snaking river, I, uh, I turned into that painting. Which, uh, again, it's, it's five panels, and I initially presented it as five panels, like, that, um, like the other copy painting, which was called Hive. Um, again, I think I was thinking of compartments of space, living space. Um, I own this painting myself, actually, but I actually should, well, it's not on my wall at the moment, but when it is, I show it as one. Before it was originally going to be shown separated, um, but, but I prefer it like this now. Um, this painting is called Cropland, and um, um, and the and so then the next painting here. This is the sort of the, the piece of land next next door to it. Where are we? Um, so I, I I grew up in the 1980s. And, uh, and as a child of the 1980s, I had computer games. You know, not the computer games that people have today, but the kind of um, more imaginative ones, I would say. You know, today everything, there's, the technology is so great that there's one game to the next is it completely indistinguishable. They all just look the same because they all look like the real, real thing. But back then, like a low budget movie, you have more creativity. The, uh, the, the license that the, the, the designers had to do was much more interesting. And I think I, having grown up with that sort of visual vocabulary, as well as obviously painting uh, um, history, that obviously feeds into a, you know, a painter who grew up in the 80s that's exposed to that. That's all just part of their, their, visual, um, their visual baggage. So I w wanted to make a painting, and I wanted to inject a little bit of that. So I wanted to get had a slightly sort of a, uh, 80s sort of arcade game about it. Uh, and the other thing is that 
in this painting is four panels, but I wanted to divide the space in seven, um, but independent of the actual panels. So it's, it's I did it um, more explicitly in a, a slightly in another painting, which you'll see. But it's, you, you can almost see that there's a division of color where the color shifts uh, independently of where the panels are. So I, went, so I was trying to get some sort of um, uh, friction uh, um, of, the, of the way the painting was read as, a, as, a, as an object, as an, as an, as an, imi an image. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so that's an installation shot of the second show at uh, Grimm Gallery. The, um, this is the painting on the side, which I titled Harlequin. And this painting here, which we saw, which I titled uh, Chrysler, I think those teeth in front, it kind of felt like the, the, the front hood of a uh, Chrysler car or something, so I just called it Chrysler. Um, after this second show, I moved um, back from Paris to London, and, um, and I wanted to take those satellite source images and make some, um, make some galaxy paintings. This painting of uh, Cropland, I'd actually, this was the third attempt before I got it right. I made two uh, previous ones where I, I messed up, but in the messing up, I'd made completely randomly um, uh, different paintings that would, uh, uh, I described as galaxy paintings, but they, they have different titles. But I, they were sort of monochrome, um, but I wanted to make some uh, two more that had uh, uh, taken to another level. So back, so in London, this is me and my, my studio. Um, the studios are getting a little bit better now. I haven't yet managed to have I haven't got to the stage where I've got a better studio than the one, the one I had 10 years ago, but 30 years. But incrementally, I'm getting there. Um, so this is, uh, um, this is a um, painting that says titled Assembly. Again, this, this, this six panels. And, um, and it's the same source of sat satellite imagery underneath. There it, is, uh, there it is finished. I wanted it to kind of feel like either you might be lying down on the ground looking up at the, up at the stars and using the, the the source imagery as a uh, as a um, um, as a replacement, as an alternative for the uh, for the universe, because I mean uh, the, the fractals that you see in the universe and on Earth, they there's infinite uh, similarities. It's all the same stuff, you know. So it seemed when I saw those satellite source images, I thought this could quite easily be converted without uh, uh, I, I could convert this into the into the universe. Alternatively, you could have seen it as actually being in the universe and looking through it down on Earth, in which case the satellite images is what it is, it is land. So I wanted it to have a, a, a sort of a, um, an ambiguous reading about where you, where you were in, in, the, in the space. Uh, I made another painting at the same time, and um, this is a detail of that other painting, um, slightly larger than this one. So this, sorry, this one I should point, I don't know if you can see from the photograph. So it's like, it's almost four meters long and uh, two, two meters high. Um, here's a detail of the other one. It's, um, they're dark paintings. Uh, when you look at them at a distance or in a photograph, when you see them close up, there's, there's a lot of, of color going on in there. And, and, uh, and again, even they kind of look monochrome or, or duochrome or something like that, but there's actually a lot of drawing and imagery going on throughout there. Um, so, um, the previous year, I'd had a, a holiday in the States, and um, uh, and there was this. And one of the things I, I, I liked about the holiday was driving up from uh, San, uh, San Diego to San Francisco, and I loved the, the the road along the coast, Pacific Highway, I think it's 101. And I thought I really wanted to make a sort of a cinematic road trip painting. Um, I liked the uh, these telegraph poles and the uh, the yellow line that you get on the on the road. It, it's not really visible there, but it's a much more as a, for a painter, it's a much more funkier yellow uh, than that. Uh, certainly more in, uh, good than the, the roads in England. You can see why they write songs about the roads in America. You, you can't write a song about the M25 in England. Um, and also, I'd been thinking a little bit about the Northern Lights and uh, whether I'd put the Northern Lights over it. But, and I made a painting uh, of that same size, but it was, it was much more uh, easily read as the Northern Lights. I wasn't happy with that at all, and I thought, let me try and take it to another uh, area where it wouldn't necessarily be read as the Northern Lights, it could have multiple readings. Uh, over here on the, on the left, you can see there's a, at the bottom there's a watercolor and at the top there's a woodcut, um, where it shows that there's a little bit more Northern Lights. But basically, I thought, I'm not gonna do that, I don't like that, I don't even like the green. Um, so that painting of Chrysler that had that top part, 
I kind of t imagined what might what might be above that if I continued it. So I I, I, I designed uh, this shape, if you like, uh, as a kind of um, speech bubble slash atomic explosion slash uh, cloud northern lights. I wanted it to have m multiple uh, uh, readings and be quite sort of uh, stylistically uh, ambiguous. Um, also, uh, the um, from the uh, in the second show, I had planned and wanted to make a, a, a tree painting. Uh, as I, although I kind of work in the sort of the, the genre of landscape, I know that there is these sort of subgenres that you get, and there is a subgenre of, of the forest, which um, uh, a lot of uh, great painters have, have, have done. Obviously, most famously, uh, Klimt did a forest painting. Um, and uh, I wanted to do my own, and so uh, and I hadn't managed to do it in the first, in the second show. Um, I wasn't really quite understanding, quite sure how to do it at that point. But I subsequently sort of figured out a, an approach. In this photograph, um, I think the reason why it's very difficult to find it is that source material for me is not immediately obvious. Like, oh, that's a great painting. I'll just go and paint that. The actual source material is pretty not that exciting. It's it's it's, it's it's, it's what I do to it, hopefully, that, that, that gives it that. So it means that I have to kind of have an idea in my mind and then try and find something that might help me. Because I'm a figurative painter, I still need some, I, need to, I still need to put some, you know, some gravy on that meat. I need some, something to physically paint, you know, even if I, so, uh, although I want to make a, a, a tree painting in my mind, which is a pretty abstract concept, just a tree painting, I still need something in which to work from. Um, but this in itself isn't really good. When you're searching through loads of images, nothing is springing to mind. And this is not a particularly interesting image. But I took this section up here in, on the left-hand corner, just, this, uh, just the top left-hand corner, and then uh, put that in Photoshop. And then with, a, uh, with the mouse, just drew some lines down in front of it. I wanted to give it another layer of, of trees. Uh, so I added my own. Um, and then. Uh, so there's me uh, making making that painting. Again, I'm, I'm still completely hooked on multi-paneled work, so this is a uh, four-panel painting. It's still really useful for, for me at this stage just to separate the painting and just sort of, if, again, if, if the image is getting too strong, it's, I, can, I can separate it and, and break that apart. Um, and you can see, oh, you can see, I'm sorry, you can see these, these, these lighter tones in front. Here's the finished painting, so these tones in front. <laughs> They're actually just the, what I did with the mouse, just drawing down in front of it. That, that was giving me my, my maquette uh, um, that I could work for. So that's, uh, and I made this painting, just finished it, just as my first son was born. And uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, I wrote his name down here, like it would, you know, like you might draw on a tree or with a knife or something. So he, he's, my first son's name is down in the, the right, the, the left of the, the tree. Um, um, at this point, um, Grim Gallery had um, um, given me my uh, third show. I had a date, uh, so I was set set myself to work on on, on that. And uh, because I, I was quite pleased with the um, the tree painting, it was quite successful in my mind. It had gestated a long time in my mind before I was ready to make it. Um, sort of rehearsing the the, um, the 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 thing in my mind. For, and a lot of paintings happen for many that happen in my mind for a, a, many years before I actually make it. You know, for example, the uh, what I'm doing right now is pro had probably arrived in my mind at some point around now. You know, and, and the ideas that I'm coming up with now will probably see the light of day in, in, a, in a few years' time. But here's the uh, here's another tree painting, and I wanted to make this one a little bit more uh, psychedelic. There's. Um, you know, in the 60s, the psych psychedelia in the 60s had a strong, inf um, strongly influenced by the uh, sort of turn of the century, the Belle Epoque and the uh, Art Nouveau, Edwardian, that whole sort of um, uh, time frame where uh, autumnal colors and, and, and very sort of flowy lines and things. And, uh, and be being influenced by 60s psychedelia and, and uh, Nabi painters, the, the Art Nouveau, Mucco and all those things, I wanted to try and inject all that a lot more into this painting. And, and I was reading a book called, um, it's a Tom Wolfe book, um, um, 
the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which is a book that uh, chronicles the exploits of Ken Kesey, uh, who wrote, who was the author of One for the Cuckoo's Nest. But he was a, a crazy individual who, at this point, he was like a sort of a, he was, the pro, he was a proto-hippie, beatnik proto-hippie. Uh, and uh, in the early 60s, before the hippies even existed, he was driving around on a uh, school bus, which he painted with his friends in Dago colors, and they were handing out spiked um, orange juice to everyone, basically getting the whole country completely tripped out. On the, and they were obviously going on their own trip. Um, and uh, in one of the chapters in the book, he's sort of hanging out in this place, in this forest in uh, California called La Honda. So I called this painting La Honda. And um, this painting next to it, um, uh, this, so this was in 2000, we're now in 2012, I think 2012, 2013, 2012. I kept noticing around the summer, this is the summertime, and every, all the girls were wearing this combination of black and blue. They're always wearing either black trousers and a blue top or blue trousers, and, and, but I really loved this particular sort of cobalt cerulean blue next to this black. And, every, and, and I, after seeing this particular fashion for this, this color combination, I was like, I'm going to make a painting with those colors. It's, it's, it's really nice. So, I, that, so I, um, I made that. And then when I did it, uh, again, thinking about the show and the space of the, um, uh, the Grimm Gallery, which at this point is actually the, there was a new gallery space. The previous two shows were, were up in the, uh, in the Odan on the canal. And this one was a completely new space for me. And uh, I had the idea that maybe I could make an installation out of this idea. Um, so I, if, I thought if I make two more paintings and I put them either side, I could do kind of something a little bit Kubrick-esque. Um, so I made this little model. And uh, I sent this to Jorg. And, and I didn't want to be kind of like, you have to build me a wall, which is what he had to do in order to do it. You know, so I was hopefully going to catch his enthusiasm without actually having to ask for him to build a wall. So I thought I'll make the model first and just sort of email him and say, yeah, "It's an idea. You know, maybe you might like it." You know, he loved it. He liked it. He built the wall. So I made the two paintings, and and, and I wanted to do it in such a way that um, the I, I thought I could do this in a way where I can create a really strong sort of Renaissance sense of perspective and kill it at the same time if I make the two side paintings smaller. So that even and if you stand in a certain place, you'll have these uh, the tops of the, uh, the the two paintings, or the, it, actually sort of sitting at the same level as the back painting because it's higher. You know, it's it, because it's a base, It's like you know, uh, in Father Ted, is that cow small or is it far away? You know, so this painting here in the middle, it's the larger painting. It's further away. It gives a compression of space, and also I thought that the, this, these so these side paintings, even though they look identical to the middle one. There are these subtle, very subtle changes in them that allow for this, uh, this, what I was hoping would happen in the final thing. And one of them was to put the, uh, the, the, the point between the black and the blue on the sides, pitch it a little bit lower so that uh, it sits lower than your eye line. And you have a sense of a falling horizon. So even though each painting has the same uh, horizon, the, the end points are at the same height from each other, um, but you have an, an effect of it. Um, uh, falling away as, as uh, uh, at either side. This is actually a, you can see it's two photographs I've just collaged together for the slideshow. Um, the space in my studio was is just fractionally bigger than the space that we we earmarked in the gallery, um, and they were going to build this floating wall for the central panel. But it gave me an approximation to be able to get it right, and I, and I was able to put th this painting on an easel to actually measure it out and get it all lined up so that I could just get this could get this working. Um, there's the, the, the final thing. And hopefully you can see in this photograph that it, even though each panel has, a, um, has this horizon line um, that's just slightly curved, that it does feel like a, a, a continuous uh, uh, a wraparound environment. And these, what kind of looks a bit like a sort of a sunset is actually um, an alignment, in my mind anyway, that uh, was like a sort of a, an alignment of planets. Uh, and then the, the color above, Again, I guess you know a lot of people would read it as a as a rainbow, but for me it was almost like a sort of a the the, the level in the stratosphere, a sort of fractalized color. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I love my favorite film is 2001: Space Odyssey. So this was this was my painterly version of, of of doing a kind of a a 2001: Space Odyssey uh, inspired painting. 
Um, there's the uh, Lohonda that's uh, uh, finished. Um, and again, a, a more um, uh, more dynamic than the other painting. The other, the green one, was more sort of all over. This one's getting a bit more uh, paisley. It's like, it's like um, you know, when I said Superman, I felt it was like that Superman painting looked like Superman stretched over a canvas. I thought this one, in my mind, looked like uh, uh, Ken Kesey wearing a paisley shirt disguised as a forest. That was my entry point <laughs> for the painting. Um, this is the, um, okay, so this is another. This, this uh, thing on the side here is, an, um, is a, a watercolor done after an MRI scan. In 2009, I had this, um, over the course of two days, I had a very strange uh, experience. Uh, in one evening, I went blind for 20 minutes, and um, which, you know, 20 minutes isn't very long, but uh, after 19 minutes, you don't know that it's going to end. You're, you're getting very concerned. Luckily, it ended. But then the next day, at almost exactly the same time, I had, again, lasting for about 20 minutes. It wasn't blindness, but it was uh, what I described to the doctors as psychedelic distortions. It was like I was looking through a, a kaleidoscope, and they gave, they did loads of MRI tests on me, um, but they couldn't, um, because of whatever happened at that point wasn't happening during the tests, they weren't able to tell. They, but they, the closest they got was that it might have been what they described as an aura, which was like a visual migraine. Um, um, and um, since then, I haven't had any uh, anything like that. But but if I see uh, red and blue together, a particular what seems to, what I think seems to be a particular kind of red next to a particular kind of blue, it gets very uh, uh, agitated, and, and I can't look at it. Um, and it's it's kind of jumping out at me like in a, in a, so. Uh, in my child's uh, bedroom, he's got this um, this floor mat, which is exactly that blue and exactly that red. And I had to get rid of it because I couldn't uh, I couldn't get in the room. Um, this is the, so this is the, uh, that painting. Now this painting here, um, I titled Further. Further is the, uh, is, and spelt uh, U-R at the end, not E-R. Further with an exclamation point. This, this, um, this title is derived from the bus that Ken Kesey and his, uh, and his merry pranksters took around America, handing out uh, uh, spiked orange juice. And, um, and I, made a, I made three, uh, I made two more paintings uh, of, of Further. There's this, this is the other one I made. This is with copper paint, which was, uh, I saw a Frank Stella exhibition around this time, and uh, I loved those uh, copper paintings, so I thought, I'm gonna make a copper painting. Over there at the end is the other galaxy painting, which I titled after the show. The show was called Further Planetarium. Uh, I had an idea for the show after seeing this uh, Zabladovich space. I don't, I'm probably not saying that in the right way. After seeing that space, I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic? As often when I see some, some new spaces, I imagine my own sort of show in it, maybe, you know, egotistical to do, but why not? So, and in that space, I thought it would be fantastic to turn it into a planetarium, put, make the, black, the, the, the back room as a, as a planetarium and put the, what, what, that blue installation uh, of those three paintings in the middle space and then have the sort of the harlequin, the, 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 um, the satellite imagery in the front and have a, have a real uh, cohesive, uh, um, um, Space, maybe you'd have some sort of planetarium uh, uh, sound effects running through, you know, like uh, um, something out of like, uh, I think the person who did the voice for Hal in 2001 narrated a planetarium in Canada. This is um, my second attempt at that Harlequin painting. This is called Arcade. Uh, it's a little bit more um, uh, explicit, where I've made each panel uh, have that, uh, that color shift. And I gave it a kind of a, uh, a I gave it a little system in my mind where I had, um, uh, let me see, because this is like a few years ago now, and, uh, and, uh, but you have uh, purple, the, 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 it's, it's sort of shifting chromatically, so you have purple into, into red in the first one, into the second one goes into uh, orange, into yellow, and the third one it goes into uh, green, into blue, and then the, into the fourth one back into uh, purple, into orange, and it shifts across like that. Um, I was never going to sort of slavishly adhere to that. It's it's got it's got to flow a bit more organically. But uh, I kept a little bit of that rule book going on in my mind just to uh, just to see whether it would uh, give it a sort of a, a dynamic tension of uh, of the colours shifting across. Um, 
Now this uh, painting I had been sort of painting on the side while I was making these other shows because this was such a large painting. This is 2.3 meters tall and, uh, and it's, um, it's like five meters long with all the gaps. So I was never gonna push this onto any, any sort of gallery situation, uh, especially as I had been making those other big galaxy paintings. And the, the show previous, my second show at Grimm Gallery had um, Harlequin, so I didn't, think this, I didn't think my third show was the right place to show this. Then a New York gallery approached me, uh, the James Cohen Gallery, and they made a studio visit. And they saw this painting in semi uh, state of unfinish. And, uh, and they liked it, they wanted me to finish it, they asked me to finish it for the show, which was fantastic because of the, it, was, it gave me the time to, to finish the painting that I wanted. So I, I, made, I finished this painting for the New York show and, um, and still on the groove of, of these trees, I wanted to make more, I wasn't ready, and I'm still not ready to stop making these tree paintings because I think I can still take them and push them further. Um, but, uh, oh sorry, so here's some detailed shots of, the, of, of, our, of this painting arcade. Uh, I think with the dots up here, I think I was probably being influenced a little bit by late uh, Picasso, and uh, who I think was riffing on um, uh, Bonnard a bit. Um, and I wanted to kind of make it feel a little bit uh, macro, micro, like you could be looking under a microscope, uh, sort of germs and uh, bacterial. But uh, obviously, but, the, but its source is, is figurative. But the end result, I hope, is a little bit more than just the sum of its parts. Um, here's the third tree painting I made. Um, uh, and uh, this painting over here is a little small uh, uh, silver painting with what's kind of like a sort of a, um, it's called Atomic Flower Power. Um, and uh, I kind of imagined it as a sort of a slightly sort of psychedelic sort of Jasper John's target got, um, gone wrong. Um, um, but, uh, and I wanted the space to sort of wrap around. So you, you know, you start with the tree painting, which is the most figurative of, of uh, and then here I had these these sort of landscapes. These are woodcuts, which I subsequently developed into a painting in my next show. But uh, here they're woodcuts, and I wanted them yellow, orange, red, so that the, this painting on the the left would shift across, which would then move around to the arcade painting, and then the colours of that get more intense and they would sort of do their, their shifting, which I described, and then off to this painting here, using that same um, um, motif um, that I've used previously. And uh, I was looking at the, um, I was thinking about the album cover for Dark Side of the Moon, where you have that, uh, that prism that, that explodes out that sort of fractal um, uh, uh, colored light. And I thought that uh, I could separate the, uh, the, the sky and the space with this, um, with a really intense, um, um, fractal of, of light, and also I thought that maybe with the, the the colors in the arcade shifting across would almost be like they're shooting out onto this painting, which would then wrap back around to the sort of the full stop of this little explosion. So that was that show in New York. Um, I'm getting, as the shows are developing, I'm getting more and more interested in the uh, in the actual exhibition and the installation, and, and the, rather than just sort of making paintings and just sort of chucking them up on the wall. Um, that show's over, I want to make another tree painting. And uh, a little bit like with the New York, at this point a gallery in Los Angeles approached me. They wanted me to uh, have a show in their space. Their space was enormous. The, the gallery space was uh, 300 meters squared and uh, I'd never worked on a scale that large. And, um, and they told me that um, when they came to visit, um, they offered me the show before they came to visit me actually. And, uh, and then when they said they'd give me a show, I immediately had ideas in my mind about Los Angeles, uh, apocalyptic Los Angeles in the 1950s. You know how like every city kind of has a golden age, you know, Paris in the 20s. Los Angeles kind of felt very 50s to me. And so I was immediately thinking about those sorts of 50s colors, pinks and tans and turquoises and things like that. Uh, so I thought I'd try and push this painting a little bit more in that sort of, uh, uh, that, that zone. Um, and also I thought, what a great opportunity to make the cinematic road trip painting that was inspired by Los Angeles, by, by, by California, and, and actually show it in Los Angeles. So I, I made um, the third and probably the, the final of the series. Um, but um, so when they actually came a, couple, a month or two later to visit my studio, I had prepped my idea of what I was gonna sort of show uh, in terms of numbers, and they were like, you've gotta make a lot more work, you know. Uh, 
And one of their artists came to visit me who, who um, basically said the same thing. He said, you know, dude, you've not, you, you've, that's, a th that's an enormous gallery, you've got to fill it. So I'm going into complete panic mode for, oh, it, incidentally, sorry, one small point is when I made this painting, my second son is being born just at about this point. So for the entire duration of, of making my, my show in Los Angeles, um, my, my youngest is, uh, is, is going from zero. He's now 14 months old. Uh, and we have a live work, so it's all, you know, my, my two studio assistants, one is three and a half years old and the other one's 14 months old, so they're, they're not that helpful at the moment. Um, 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 so, uh, and I'm trying to make the kind of, the, the show that I propose for them is, is not only is what I want to do, but it's also what I physically can do. Um, but when they say they wanted more, of course I say yes to them because of, not going to say no to them, to them, but I go into a complete tailspin trying to fulfill the demands of this enormous space, uh, and then and I'm kind of not showing them what I'm doing because I kind of don't want them to know that I'm kind of failing at, at their expectation, and it gets to the point it's getting quite close to the to the show time, and they need to see work now. They've got to get some images coming, and they've got to know what's going on. So I kind of send them the emails ex expecting to be murdered the next day. Uh, and, and their response was, oh, it's too much work. So I was like, you know, okay, great. <laughs> you know, I didn't say anything, of course, you know, but uh, anyway, so this is, the, uh, this is another painting. This was actually the painting that was derived from that woodcut from the New York show. Um, in actual fact, uh, in terms of the, the, the actual space itself, so this is actually the painting from the, uh, the third show at Grimm Gallery uh, Assembly. I, I wanted it, or I always wanted it in the show, and I said, can I have it in the show? It makes perfect sense for the rest of the paintings. They were happy for that, and, and frankly, because of a space that large, it was good that I had that. Um, and it was good actually to have, the, even though I was under the impression that I had to fill the space wall to wall with paintings, not actually wanting to do that. This is the kind of show I wanted to make, and, and, they, and they were super happy with it, and, and it's exactly what it should have been. Uh, but it would have been a much more, uh, a less stressful um, making that show over 12 months than, rather than trying to making a show three times bigger and still ending up with the show that I always ever wanted. Um, you know, this, this is not, it has this more space to breathe these paintings like this, you know, I think to overcrowd them. And also, you know, they're, 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 you know to hang that painting next to that painting, I think would, would kill each other. And I think that they need to have that space. But I wanted to have the, um, um, so at the, as you walk into the gallery, you have the, the further painting with the road, so you have that sort of figurative sense of space running along the gallery wall. And then almost every element of the show is contained in that painting. You have, so you have the land, the trees, the sky. Uh, so on that painting on this side, you've got the, 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 the stars. And then on that um, opposite, it you've got, and I, I titled the show "The Cloud Is Growing in the Trees." I wanted a kind of a slightly, um, what felt like maybe a, a sort of an enigmatic, um, psychedelic statement, where I'd have um, this sort of um, this cloud rising, uh, rising here in this painting, and then sort of crystallizing over here in in in, in this in the further painting, and then and then dissipating across in the, in the last painting in the back room, which was uh, uh, based on an image that I, I've done before, as you'll recognize. Um, so this is the back room, here's some smaller work, sort of riffing on, the, on this, 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 this concept that I had of, of the clouds and the trees. Uh, and here's the, um, this painting actually was made um, the day after, I started it the day after their studio visit where they told me that my show was not ambitious enough and I needed to make 10 times the amount of work. So I went into a complete panic and, and made this painting because I, um, I was umming and ahhing about whether I should do it, you know, because of the images being used in the New York show. And then when you've got someone uh, drilling down on you to make a lot of work, all of a sudden those considerations become less important. You just, you know, so I made that. In actual fact, this is the best painting out of the entire series. Uh, but a lot of the paint, a lot of the serial work is presented, um, in the past it's been presented in one show, so there's the Institute paintings would be in that show, blue paintings in this show, but I don't, I'm not working in that sort of head mode, like I, I've got my um, the blue painting hat on or whatever, so it's much more free flowing and organic, you know, the tree paintings you could constitute as a series, but I've got no intention of showing them as a series, I will make, 
they're also very draining to make. They take a long time to make, about three to four months to make each. So as soon as I've finished one painting, of one of those tree paintings, the last thing I want to do is to make another one. So I've been kind of making one a year and I'm ready to make another one now. I've got a really good idea for another one. Um, so this, I think that one there is the best one. So the, the gallery, the only reason why I'm showing this uh, picture is to show off. That's it. There's no real reason other than that. Just, you know, there, it's because it's Los Angeles, you know, it's not a walking town, it's all by, by a car. So they have the big adverts and things like that. So they have this enormous uh, poster of my, uh, my painting on, on, their, on their wall. With, with, so I'm just showing off, that's it. I, lo I love it. That was one of the highlights of going to Los Angeles, was seeing that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you just want to quickly just see the last painting I'm working on, I'll just say it. There it is. That's what's in the studio at the moment. two of your paintings in our collection and one of them I can place within the works we've seen so far but one of them I can't so I was hoping whether you could tell me a bit about it and it's uh, it has a fantastic title also um, how to stop whining and start living yeah um, that was made in the uh, in, in Dertilliers that was a um, my uh, my, 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 I don't know if he's here. Is Nathan here? One of my friends from uh, Dertilliers was a collage artist and uh, he had loads of source material and stacks of archival stuff and, uh, and I was just looking through that and I saw, and I saw these two, uh, um, two images that I really liked and I said to him, can I, can I take these? Can I use them? One was a picture of, um, uh, I guess, uh, 19th century or turn of the century um, people who are standing around uh, this sort of sequoia trees in the forest, I guess in the redwood forest, probably in California, uh, and they're all holding hands. And another photograph was of a, um, again, a sort of turn of the century uh, oil, oil rig, oil well, kind of like, what's that film that came out a few years ago, There Will Be Blood, you know, that, that, sort, of, that, that sort of thing. And I just, uh, I just saw these two images and I thought this, these, these two images work together in, in, in a more interesting way together than, than in their own individual parts. And also there was a, a, um, a book uh, that um, my friend had that um, it was an atlas, again at the turn of the century atlas. And I thought I would paint uh, these people in this environment using the index of the, the, the 19th century atlas. So, the, so I uh, basically lined the, um, the atlas um, the index of the atlas on the on the uh, on the paper, and then paint that, and then that's the image. That's so it's those three things, and then the title is from a, a self help book. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. How to stop whining and start living? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then it was funny because then I, uh, yeah, ING Bank bought it. Yeah, how funny is that? Perfect. <laughs> um, William, I noticed that uh, you work in cycles, mm -hmm. um, which I like very much. So you don't have the tree period or the cloud period, but uh, every year you may do one cloud or one whatever. Mm -hmm. um, do you slowly gravitate towards what I see now is uh, almost like land art type of yeah thing. I mean yeah but will you continue to do you said you have one more um, uh, tree painting but will will your cycles yes mm -hmm. do you see them like carrying on and they keep refining yes I think the the imagery is getting uh, uh, simpler and perhaps 
you, you could say more prosaic in, in the sense that, you know, the, those first slides, you know, uh, um, astronauts on a planet or, or cockpits, you know, I wouldn't paint uh, the Enola Gay again. I think it's, there's too much. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not, I love those paintings. I mean, I'm very proud of them. But uh, I, I like, um, I want the, um, I, I'm, I'm more into uh, simplifying the imagery. And, and uh, so, yeah. The, uh, Sky trees, the, these sort of more elemental uh, things, and um, in replace of that, you have something else, which is the the actual physical painting and the experience. All the stuff which you don't get from seeing the painting on the slides. I mean, if, if I was going in the other direction and I was abandoning the 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 way they're painted and their physical being, it's concentrating on the uh, on more of the imagery, then the slideshow would be a much more dramatic, interesting thing. But I mean, it's better to see the paintings than to than just to see, because all you're getting here is iconography, and I'm and I'm reducing the iconography, and you know.